All right, this video is covering chapter 19 of improving vocabulary skills. If you have your book, you can open up to page 110 um, as we go along. Um, so let's take a uh, read here at the words here and guess as to parts of speech. Uh, avid, dwindle, esteem, evoke, legacy, mediate, there's a clue there with the eight sound, muted, nurture, pacify, transient. Okay, our first word here is avid, and this one is an adjective. Suki, an avid reader, enjoys nothing more than a good science fiction novel. Artie is such an avid sports fan that he has two televisions tuned to different sporting events, so he doesn't miss any action. Um, avid means um, devoted, but it means devoted in a different way um, than, than we thought of before. Um, Devoted can mean like that you uh, that you give that you give all your attention to um, to something. Um, for example, if you're devoted to your work or you're devoted to your job, that means that you give all your attention to it um, and you um, spend all your time with it. Um, but when we talk about avid, um, it's similar in in that you spend a lot of time with it, but it has a different meaning. <clears throat> it's not that you um, necessarily that you work towards it. Um, it. It tends to mean more if you're avid. Avid term tends to uh, deal more with the things that excite you, uh, the things that you're excited about. So in the first example it says he's an avid, um, sorry, she's an avid reader, um, meaning that that reading excites her, that um, that um, she gets a lot of pleasure out of it, and part of the reason that she uh, does it a lot or devotes so much to it is because it's exciting. Um, the same tr is true uh, for an avid sports fan. You know, an avid sports fan is someone who likes Real Madrid or Barcelona. They um, spend a lot of their time watching those teams, but the reason why they do that is because they uh, they enjoy it. Okay, so our next word here is dwindle, and this is a verb. As the number of leaves on the tree dwindled, the number of uh, number on the ground increased. Chewing nicotine gum helped uh, Doreen's cravings for cigarettes to dwindle. She smoked fewer and fewer cigarettes each day until she quit altogether. So dwindle means to but um, it means to slowly to slowly decrease um, uh, rather than to decrease in a in a huge amount. So in the first example, it's talking about the number of trees. Uh, like um, in the fall, um, the the leaves from the tree slowly fall off of the tree. Um, so they dwindle. They don't decrease all of the sudden, but they slowly decrease. Um, in the second example, when you're trying to quit smoking using the nicotine gum, it's not going to be all that, uh, you know, right away you start using the gum and, and your um, craving or your desire for cigarettes is completely gone, but um, it means it slowly goes away. Uh, dwindle can also be used um, like... Uh, um, not so much for time, but you know the money in your bank account <laughs> dwindled means it slowly got uh, less and less. So the two important parts to remember about this one is that it decreases, yeah, or shrinks, um, but it's gradual. It's not sudden. The next word here is esteem, and this one's a noun. When Mr. Boward retired from coaching basketball for 30 years, his admiring students gave him a gold whistle as a sign of their esteem. The critics had such esteem for the play that they voted it best drama of the year. Esteem means um, admiration uh, for something. Uh, when you, you'll often hear it used in this um, expression to hold in esteem or to have esteem for. Um, what this means is is that you have a lot of um, admiration for something, or you uh, you hold something in high regard. Um, to think highly of someone is to hold it in um, esteem. Um, on page 111, esteem is high regard, respect, favorable opinion. Um, so 
when you hold something in esteem, it means that you think that it's a really that it's a really good thing, um, not just in quality, but not not just necessarily in the the quality of it, um, but also in um, I, I can't think of a way of, of putting it. Um, for example, if you if you hold um, um, uh, a teacher or if you hold a, a friend of yours in esteem, it means we have an expression of almost of, of putting someone on a pedestal. It means like that that you hold them up, that you think that they're a good example of a, of a good um, good person or a good friend, a good teacher or something like that, and that you really respect that person. Next word here is evoke, and this one is a verb. Music can evoke powerful feelings. A sweet violin solo often moves its listeners to tears. The smells of cider and pumpkin pie evoke thoughts of autumn. Evoke means to um, to bring out. So I, I forget if we had the word before provoke, um, but provoke means to cause something to happen. And evoke is some some somewhat similar. Um, no, we didn't have provoke. That must have been a different chapter or a different class. Um, but provoke means uh, you're something from the outside. Um, uh, is is causing an action. Now, evoke is is similar. Something from the outside causes it. But when we talk about evoke, we talk about um, the 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 action or the feeling or the thoughts coming from the inside, coming from the inside out. Um, provoke more is more the the outside is 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 causing it. Um, um, on page uh, 111, evoke is uh, number five, to draw forth as a mental image or a feeling. Um, so when we're saying that something evokes something, it means that it makes you feel something or it makes you remember something. Um, I don't know if you have this experience, but, but um, you know, I traveled a lot when I was young, and I do remember places by their smells. Um, so... so particular smells when I'm out and about, if I smell a certain thing, it will evoke a memory of a place that I've been. Um, one thing particularly that I, that I always remember is um, as a child being in Hong Kong and walking down the streets, and there is something about just the smell of the of the streets. There, you know, um, there was uh, a lot of fruit stands um, out there, but there was also a lot of garbage. So there was just this weird mixture of smells. And every now and again, when I'm in a city, I'll smell that, and boom, right away, it evokes a memory of um, of being in Hong Kong. The next word here is uh, legacy, and this one's a noun. Uh, Anna's great-grandfather, grandmother, and mother were all musicians. She must have inherited their legacy of musical talent because she's an excellent piano player and guitar player. One of the richest legacies that my mother handed down to me is a love of nature. I've inherited her interest in growing uh, flowers and in hiking. So legacy is an inherited gift. Now we can talk about um, inherited gift in two ways. One way we can talk about it as sort of a genetic inherited gift. So in both of these examples we're talking about, well, really in, in um, the first one, we're talking about a genetic gift, uh, the musical legacy. And, and you'll see this in families. Um, it, people are good at music, that there is something genetic about it. It's not, practice is obviously important, but there is a, a certain natural ability. So um, a legacy can be, you know, something that's, that's, that's inherited. Um, normally, when we th when we talk about something being a legacy, it, it's not um, not n necessarily just um, um, from from one parent to a child. But in terms of a a legacy, it really means that it's something that that is um, um, passed on through throughout throughout the generations. So another legacy can be in terms of interests. In the second example, it's saying that my mother's legacy is is that now I'm interested in, um, in flowers. Um, so another way to think about uh, legacy is, you know, it's something that lasts inside of you or with you or with someone um, 
once that once the person who gave it to you has has died um, so it doesn't die with the person but it continues on um, there is in terms of colleges for those of you um, who are going to go on to college here in the United States you know one of the disadvantages that a lot of you have is that you don't have legacies and so what that means is is that oftentimes um, families from generation to generation will go to the same uh, university or the same college and this actually makes it easier to get into the college um, so uh, for example there's a legacy um, in um, in my wife's family um, of going to a university in Chicago called Northwestern um, both her mother and her aunt uh, went to that university and actually now one of Andrea's cousins is thinking of going uh, to that university as well um, but the, the legacy can be can be also in, in terms of this. Um, your legacy can also be your money, uh, you know, that you pass on to your to your child that they inherit. Our next word here is mediate, and this one's a verb. My father refused to mediate quarrels between my sister and me. He would say, settle your own fights. Each of the farmers claimed the stream was part of his property. Pardon me. Um, finally, they agreed to let the town council mediate their conflict. Mediate means to um, settle. One of the ways that I think of this word, I, I know it doesn't have the word middle in it, but uh, mediate <laughs> means to get in the middle um, between two things and to settle a, um, to settle a disagreement. Um, and normally the disagreement is some sort of active uh, conflict. Um, there's a the noun form of this is a mediator. A mediator is the person who gets in between, who who mediates the conflict. Um, oftentimes, um, uh, people who are are going through a divorce, instead of going to court, they'll get a mediator. So um, someone will come between, someone will act between them to try to find find an agreement for um, for their um, for their divorce um, uh, but but to mediate really means to to settle some sort of conflict um, by acting as a go-between between, between the, the two the two sides so acting as someone who's neutral who's in the middle who can talk to both uh, to both sides as a conflict um, as a teacher sometimes I have to mediate conflicts fortunately a lot less frequently uh, in college than I did have to in high school but there would be times when students would um, two students in the classroom would would have a problem with each other and my job was to be the mediator to um, be there to allow the two of them to um, resolve the conflict but be there to be someone neutral who is in the middle um, our next word here is muted and this is an adjective when I put in my earplugs the yelling from the next next apartment becomes muted enough so that it no longer disturbs me. The artists use muted rather than bright colors, giving the painting a, pe a quiet, peaceful tone. Muted means means soft. One of the ways to think about this is, you know, on our uh, remote controls to our TVs, we have a mute button. The mute button turns off the volume. Now, muted is not the same thing. Um, not exactly the same thing. It doesn't mean that you totally turn off something, um, but what it means is that it softens in, or it makes it less. So you can talk about it in a couple of different ways. If, if you talk about muting the noise or muted noise, um, it means that the, it's something is not as loud as what it was. But if you're talking about it in terms of colors, um, it means that the color is not as bright um, as what it was. Um, it, it's less shocking um, than what, not less shocking, but le less bright, less noticeable um, than what it was. Um, another way to think about it is is to tone down or to make something um, less uh, less intense. Um, so th you can think about this, you know, in terms. I I know very little about fashion, so I'm I'm probably just making this up. But um, it tends to be that in the winter, um, people wear more muted colors. Um, people wear less, um, um, less bright colors, um, darker colors. Whereas in the summer, people more wear brighter or more vibrant colors. Um, so in the winter, 
the the dress is more muted probably because the weather you know makes the sky more muted everything is less less bright our next word here is nurture and this one is a verb. Although I often forget to water or feed my plants, my sister carefully nurtures her many ferns and violets. Many animals feed and protect their babies, but female fish in general do not nurture their young. The female only lays the eggs, which are guarded by the male, until they hatch. So what nurture means is to take care of. But really when we're talking about nurture, we mean taking care of something that is vulnerable to help it grow until it's able to take care of itself. Um, so nurture is often used for parents to children. You nurture your children, meaning you're, you're, taking, you're taking care of them, you're protecting them until they're old enough um, that they can protect themselves. Eventually they won't need to be nurtured. There are some things that are always going to need to be nurtured, like um, plants, right? Um, uh, well, I uh, actually I don't know enough about planting to say, but but you know certain flowers, certainly the ones in your house, you you always have to pay um, careful attention to them because they're they're going to um, they're always going to need your help to be um, to um, be taken care of. But uh, the important thing is is that you know you can take care of someone like if you're babysitting, you take care of a person, but you're not really nurturing them because nurturing is not just for a short period of time. It's for that long period of time that something needs your protection and that needs your help to make it um, uh, grow. You know, as a professor or as a teacher, you know, in some ways you do nurture the students. Um, you know, you're, you're helping them, you're protecting them, you're, you're caring for them in some ways until they're able to, you know, move on um, and be successful, um, be successful on their own. Um, on page uh, 111, nurture is number nine, to promote development by providing nourishment, support, and protection. Uh, nourishment means food. Um, all right, so our next word here is uh, pacify, and this one is a verb. Uh, so this one is related to uh, uh, digging to America uh, with the pacifier, um, the binky uh, that Jaume uh, has. Um, when I'm feeling nervous or upset, I often pacify myself with a soothing cup of mint tea. Not only did I anger Robert by Roberta by calling her boyfriend a creep, but I failed to pacify her with my note of apology. I'm sorry I called Mel a creep. It's not always wise to tell the truth. So to pacify to soothe. Another way of saying soothe is to calm down. To pacify means that um, you're trying to make uh, um, someone or something that is angry, less angry or more calm. Normally pacify doesn't pacify doesn't mean that you're solving the problem, but what it means is is that you're the, the only problem that you're solving is is the anger of the moment. So if we think of that in terms of digging to America, that's the problem of a pacifier. A pacifier right um, solves the problem of the baby crying but it's not a long-term solution right because she has to have that thing in the whole time otherwise she starts crying to you know to not pacify someone or to actually fix the solution with her they need to figure out a way to get her to eat normally or get her to not want to have the the minky in her mouth um, on page 111 pacifies number four to make calm or peaceful Okay, but again, it, if you think about um, like the wars that are going on right now, uh, say in, in in Syria right now, you know, if you pacify the people, you, you're making you're making them calm, but you're not fixing. It doesn't mean that you're fixing the fixing the problem. Uh, it would be good, right, if you could pacify both sides right now, um, you know, to stop the fighting and stop all the killing. But it doesn't mean that you found a solution to the problem. Um, a, another thing that we can use uh, this one for is you may have heard of the word pacifist. A pacifist is a person who doesn't believe in war, who's against all wars, regardless of what the reason is for. But again, you know, if you're just focusing on not having a war, you're not dealing with, you know, the real problems that, that actually lead to wars. 
And our last word here is transient, and this one's an adjective. The drug's danger include both permanent brain damage and transient side effects, such as temporarily blurred vision. Um, Julia wants a lasting relationship, but Rico seems interested in only a transient one. Transient means uh, short-lived. Uh, normally when we think about, sometimes we describe people as transient, and that doesn't mean that they live for a short amount of time, but it means that they stay in one place for a short amount of time. Sometimes homeless people are referred to as transients, particularly homeless people who are, are living on the streets or begging on the streets. Um, they're considered to be transient because they're, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. They're not they don't have a consistent place to stay, so they come and they go. They come and they go. So if you're describing, you know, something as, for example, the symptoms of an illness as transient, it means that they'll be there for a period of time and then they'll go away. They're not going to live. They're not going to last forever. In the second example, if you have a transient relationship, it means that you're not you're not looking for a long-term relationship. You're just looking for an, a relationship that will last um, for a short amount of time, um, that will pass soon or or quickly. Okay, we're done. Um, go ahead and and. Uh, do the activities in the book, do, the, do your questions, and then come to class with any questions you have about things you don't understand. Take care. Bye.